much for joining us. My name is Nancy Larson. I'm the director with the Pollution Prevention Institute and my colleague Allison Crowther is working behind the scenes to help with the technology, let people in that type of thing. So there's a couple of you who signed in with just numbers. Um, um, on your name. And so if you're able to either chat to Allison or change your name in the participant button, that would be very helpful. Um, just from a security standpoint, uh, we like to make sure that we don't have unknown entities in our meeting here. So um, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, I'd like to start out with a few logistics and just confirming, I'll have my colleague confirm for me that my audio and visual is working okay. Yes, they are working Great. well. Thank you, Allison. And if any time any of you have a problem, I've sent you Allison's email. She'll be monitoring her email or you can chat if you're able to. And um, Allison can help you um, um, with any concerns that you might have or any tech technology issues you might have. So uh, good morning and again, welcome. Um, this is the fourth in a series of TCE roundtables that we've done since 2017 and primarily for the aerospace industry sector. And, and we have targeted uh, those of you who have um, registered via TRI, but then also uh, folks who are smaller sources of um, of TCE trichloroethylene. So I want to welcome you again. My name is Nancy Larson and Allison, my colleague, is helping out behind the scenes. We have a full slate for you this morning. Um, I will be the facilitator for the roundtable today. Uh, and um, um, we want to just go over a few logistics uh, here before we get into our speakers. So. Uh, from a logistics standpoint, we're asking everyone to keep themselves on mute unless you're speaking um, and keep your camera off too. That just conserves some bandwidth. Since many of us are working from home, we don't have as good a bandwidth as we would normally have at our offices. Uh, we plan to take questions at the end of each presentation and we'll ask you to chat or uh, raise your hand um, if you've got a question or comment. So for example, if you hover uh, in the lower frame of your screen, you will see both a chat feature and a hand raising feature. And between Allison and I, we will monitor the chat uh, questions and we'll facilitate that at the end. When you ask your question, if you're comfortable with it, it would be great for you to introduce yourself since we're not gonna go through um, formal introductions here uh, this morning during um, during this section anyhow. We may do that a little bit later uh, during our discussion section. We do plan to take one brief break after our first speaker, which is Katie from EPA. And we are planning to record these presentations and they will be posted uh, to both of uh, our, our Pollution Prevention Institute YouTube site as well as uh, to our TCE page on our newly and, and up newly redesigned uh, website. Um, so check that out if you haven't already. Okay, just a little bit of background for you as we get started because we do have some people joining us today that have not been on these round tables before. So as I mentioned before, um, um, this is the fourth in our series and um, and we, uh, Allison and I work for the K-State Pollution Prevention Institute. Our institute is out of the College of Engineering at Kansas State University. And uh, we help small businesses and medium and large size businesses with pollution prevention. Uh, for small businesses, we also do a small business environmental assistance program and uh, we do compliance assistance. So we help a lot of businesses get air permits, help them figure out, you know, if they've got hazardous waste, what generator category are they in? What waste codes do they need? Um, what are the performance standards they need to meet? 
we also assist with stormwater permits. And by small businesses, typically uh, those are small businesses that are 100 employees or less. Uh, we answer all questions via our hotline and email, but we do do kind of more intensive compliance assistance on site um, with those small businesses. Medium and large size businesses, we do uh, pollution prevention work. We host roundtables like this. We have an intern program. Um, we have workshops, all kinds of different things that go on uh, from a pollution prevention standpoint. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. Uh, but just a brief history, um, I will tell you the Kansas TCE roundtables have been funded by EPA through pollution prevention grants. Uh, and um, in 2017, we started these up uh, actually because one of our large industries um, was talking to me about TCE and said, hey, Nancy, why would we ever want to get rid of TCE? Uh, we're once in, always in with regard to the aerospace max standard, and that's a, an air quality standard if you, may, if you don't already know. Uh, that was when um, we started pursuing something that one of our North Carolina colleagues had been pursuing, and, um, and that was an allowance to get out of max standards uh, and area source standards if you actually eliminated the regulated uh, hazardous air pollutant, in this case, TCE. Uh, Region 7 um, air quality uh, went to their management and negotiated um, that they could come to speak to our group and, and, and actually um, um, make a way for getting out of the MAC standard if companies were to give up TCE. So uh, that was uh, one, of the, one of the things that kicked off our 2017 discussion. And then we introduced uh, via headquarters EPA, the TCE risk evaluation process. Uh, in 2018, uh, we followed up with that because our group that came in 2017 said, hey, Nancy, we'd like to hear more on this. And at that time, EPA was going through the process and had published a problem formulation statement for TCE. And there was a comment period. Um, and so we were able to host our 2018 event uh, so that companies could hear firsthand from EPA and, it, um, and then had still plenty of time to provide comment via the open comment period. We also uh, featured some Kansas TCE contamination sites and our colleagues at KDHE uh, presented that. 2019, we provided an update on the draft risk evaluation and um, we had uh, um, a representative from SafeChem come and talk about an alternative technology which uses modified alcohol. And that's an alternative to TCE and it could be used in a vapor degreaser. Uh, in 2021 um, 20, here now today, um, we um, are going to be featuring the final risk evaluation it was published in November 2020. Uh, we'll also be featuring some new alternatives. We have two great researchers who are going to be presenting to us uh, today. At this point in time, unless industry indicates otherwise, this is our last planned event. This, this is, um, we, we don't have funding to host another event like this going forward. Not that we can't work it out if industry would like it. So I just say that because uh, industry has been very good about speaking up and asking uh, for things. And if the Pollution Prevention Institute can accommodate um, this type of discussion, education, presentation uh, for industry, we want to do it. So please let us know if there is a need out there. All right, I think I got everything there. So. Today's agenda, you've all seen the agenda. I emailed it out late last night, the final agenda. It's on our website as well. And so what we're really featuring are EPA's final risk evaluation. And uh, Katie is here from EPA. She will be our first presenter in just a moment or two. And then we're gonna take a short break. And then we have, as I mentioned, two researchers presenting, one from the West Coast, one from the East Coast on TCE alternative research. These are aerospace case studies specifically. 
uh, as well as some tools that I think you'll be interested in, an opportunity actually to do some testing on your solvents. Um, we're going to have a brief update from uh, possibly two different trade associations. And then Spirit Aerosystems is partnering with the Pollution Prevention Institute on a grant. And, um, and um, Alex Tobia from Spirit uh, and myself are just going to provide a brief overview on what that project looks like in case anyone else is interested in uh, a similar type of project. So with that said, um, and unless there's any questions or concerns, um, Allison, I'll just pause for a second in case you have anything you want to add before we transition to Katie. Uh, no, and I'm not seeing any raised hands or chats. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So with that, uh, Katie, I'm going to um, let you introduce yourself uh, while I pull up your slides. I'm going to stop sharing for just a second and uh, hey, I'll turn it over to you, Katie. Great. Um, would you like me to share my video just to, to show my face for a moment and then we can um, I can turn it off so we can preserve bandwidth. Oh, perfect. If you Great. actually, as you present, um, and, uh, as you present, I will turn my video off and it's great to have the presenter keep their video on. So okay, great. I would, I would appreciate that. Thank you so much. Sure. So good morning, everyone. Um, just as as Nancy pulls up my slides, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Katie McNamara and I'm the point of contact for the risk management of trichloroethylene, which I will refer to as TCE throughout this presentation. Um, I'm the lead for the TCE rulemaking at this point. Uh, previous, in previous years presentations, um, those were done by Mr. Tony Krasnick, uh, but he's moved on to a different office. I worked really closely with him and then he moved on just um, at the end of last year. And now I'm joined with my call by my, by my colleague, uh, Jeff Taylor, um, who's also on the Zoom call, who is also a risk manager of TCE working alongside me. And I'm also joined today by the chief of the existing chemicals risk management branch, um, Joel Wolf and we're looking forward to your input. Um, and, and so today I'll be presenting an overview of the TCE risk evaluation and the next steps for the risk management process. So with that, uh, we can go on to um, slide two. So slide two shows the agenda. Uh, during this presentation, I will provide you with a background on the risk evaluation process. Uh, the unreasonable risk findings and the risk management requirements under TOSCA. I will also talk about the types of information that we'll use during risk management and the principles of transparency during risk management um, and also where to find additional information. And I'll be covering some of this, the same information that I presented at the TCE public webinar um, that happened in December. Uh, the recording is available on our website, but I know Nancy will also make all these materials available to you as well. Uh, next slide. So slide three shows that TOSCA requires EPA to evaluate the manufacturer, including import, processing, distribution and commerce, use and disposal of existing chemical substances and identify those conditions of use which present unreasonable risks to health or the environment. The evaluation was done without consideration of costs or other non-risk factors and also included unreasonable risk to those potentially exposed or susceptible subpopulations relevant to this risk evaluation. Um, TOSCA also requires completion of the risk evaluation process within three to three and a half years. Next slide. Uh, slide four has a diagram that shows the risk evaluation process and timeline. Uh, TCE was one of the first 10 chemicals and was not subject to the prioritization step. Uh, the box in the middle outlines the steps taken during risk evaluation 
And at this point, the final risk evaluation of TCE has been completed and EPA has determined which conditions of use present unreasonable risk. Um, so now we are in the risk management action step of the process for those conditions of use with unreasonable risk. Next slide. Um, slide five indicates that the final risk evaluation of, there we go, of TCE was published on November 24th. And it was the culmination of a process that included the publication of a draft risk evaluation, a problem formulation, and a scope document. Um, public comments were received throughout the process and the draft risk evaluation received about 70 public comments and was peer reviewed by the Science Advisory Committee on Chemicals in March of last year. Um, and information regarding the final risk evaluation and additional materials can be found in the dockets listed on the slide, um, which you can also find on our web pages. Next slide. Slide six provides the um, general information on TCE. So TCE is a colorless liquid and volatile chemical that is produced and imported into the US. Um, it's used as a reactant in the manufacturing of other chemical substances, and it is incorporated into formulation of other products. Other conditions of use identified by EPA include the distribution and commerce, industrial and commercial and consumer uses, as well as the, the disposal of TCE. Um, some of the industrial and commercial uses of TCE include the use in vapor degreasing, uh, the use as a processing aid or in paints and coatings, and the consumer and commercial products that um, that use TCE as a solvent include adhesives and sealants, paints and coatings, cleaning and furniture care products, and other miscellaneous uses. And I'll go through those shortly. Um, and the total production volume of TCE decreased from about 220 to 171 million pounds between 2012 and 2015. Slide seven shows the life cycle diagram for TCE. This diagram is from the final TCE risk evaluation and it shows the different conditions of use identified and evaluated by EPA. Um, it's important to note that, the, that considering the wide range of uses of TCE, if you look at the, um, the top green box in the second column of processing uses, over 80% of TCE's annual production volume is used as an intermediate in the manufacturing of refrigerants. And about 15% of the remaining production volume is the use of TCE as a degreasing solvent, which Nancy informed me is the use that is most relevant to the aerospace industry. But also, please let me know if you have other uses of TCE and how the proposed rulemaking could affect you in other ways, and we'd be happy um, to discuss where those conditions of use may fall. Next slide. Slide eight shows that as a result of the risk evaluation, EPA determined that TCE does not present an unreasonable risk to the environment under the conditions of use. EPA also determined that the conditions of use listed in the slide do not present an unreasonable risk um, of injury to health. And those two conditions of use out of the 54 conditions of use that EPA determined do not present an unreasonable risk are distribution and commerce and consumer use and pepper spray. And this determination is considered a final agency action and the risk evaluation is the order that's required by TSCA. Next slide. So on slide nine, EPA found that most conditions of use of TC present an unreasonable risk during occupational exposures to workers and occupational non-users, which EPA refers to as ONUs, um, as well as to consumer users and bystanders during consumer uses. Uh, the unreasonable risks were based on cancer and non-cancer adverse effects from acute and chronic inhalation and dermal exposures to TCE. Uh, and EPA used the immune endpoints as the best overall 
endpoints um, selected for the non-cancer adverse effects. And I'll go into more detail in the following slides. So next slide. So slide 10 begins to outline the conditions of use that present unreasonable risk, including when TCE is manufactured, including imported, uh, and processed as a reactant into formulations, mixtures, or reaction products, incorporated into articles, repackaged, or recycled. TCE is also used as a solvent in industrial and commercial degreasing operations in several types of de degreasers, cold cleaners, and in aerosol spray degreasers and cleaners, as a lubricant and grease, as well as in adhesives and sealants. Next slide. This is a continuation of the list of industrial and commercial uses that present unreasonable risk, such as a functional fluid in paints and coatings, in several cleaning products, in arts and crafts materials, such as spray coatings, in corrosion inhibitors and anti-scaling agents, in process solvents used during manufacturing, in ink toner and colorant products, in automotive care products, and in other miscellaneous uses such as hoof polish, gun scrubber, and pepper spray, as well as disposal. Next slide. So slide 12 begins the comprehensive list of consumer uses that present unreasonable risk, including in brake and parts cleaner and in several aerosol and liquid products, such as degreasers and cleaners, gun scrubber, mold release, tire, tire cleaners, lubricants and greases, and adhesives and sealants. Next slide. And as well as in uh, more adhesives and sealants, <laughs> in cleaning and furniture care products, in arts and crafts materials, as well as in shoe polish, fabric spray, film cleaner, hoof polish, and toner aid. And I also like to note here that all the consumer uses present unreasonable risk with the exception of the consumer use of pepper spray, as I had mentioned earlier on slide nine. Next slide. On slide 14 are the health hazards identified in the unreasonable risk determination for workers and ONUs during occupational exposures to TCE. EPA determined that these were immunosuppression effects from acute inhalation and dermal exposures, autoimmunity effects from chronic inhalation and dermal exposures, as well as cancer from chronic inhalation and dermal exposures. In occupational settings, the risk evaluation calculated risk estimates for workers handling TCE, as well as risk estimates for occupational non-users, which are workers in the vicinity doing other activities that do not include handling TCE directly. And in the risk evaluation, EPA assumed use of personal protective equipment for workers and EPA considered the fact that there is an OSHA Pell of, or permissible exposure limit of 100 parts per million for TCE as an eight hour time weighted average. And in the case of TCE, many conditions of use present an unreasonable risk to workers, even when EPA assumed use of respirators with an assigned protection factor of 10 or 50 and gloves with a protection factor of 10 or 20. EPA does not assume respirator or glove use for some of the small commercial facilities that perform such uses, such as the spot cleaning, wipe cleaning, shoe polishing, hoof polishing, or commercial printing and copying uses. And therefore those uses present unreasonable risk due to inhalation and dermal exposures. And EPA does not assume that ONUs use PPE because they do not handle the chemical. Next slide. So slide 15 explains the basis for unreasonable risk for consumers and bystanders. EPA's deter determination is based on immunosuppression effects from acute inhalation and dermal exposures. It's important to note that EPA does not assume dermal exposure for bystanders since they don't handle the products containing TCE. 
Also, EPA does not assume use of personal protective equipment by consumers or bystanders. The unreasonable risk determinations for consumer uses were based on the high intensity use, but for many of the conditions of use, unreasonable risk was also presented for moderate intensity use. I also like to point out that EPA did not evaluate chronic exposures to TCE for consumer users and bystanders because EPA considered the frequency of product use to be too low to create chronic risk concerns. Next slide. So at this point in the presentation, this is slide 16, um, and I will transition to outlining the risk management requirements under TSCA. So now that EPA has determined which conditions of use present unreasonable risk, EPA is required to, to take action so that TCE no longer presents such unreasonable risk. Under TSCA, the statutory time frame for EPA to propose a rule is one year after the risk evaluation is completed, and a final rule two years after the risk evaluation is completed. The other specific requirements include the consideration of alternatives when selecting certain risk management options and a statement of effects. Uh, we'll be looking for input from stakeholders throughout the process as it's critical in the development of the rulemaking for TCE. And this can be in the form of participating in public events or one-on-one -on -one meetings. So please reach out to me um, as I'm the point of contact for TCE. And we do expect a significant increase in regulatory activity due to all of the unreasonable risk findings across the conditions of use. Next slide. And Katie, I'm going to break my own rule here and say we take questions at the end, but that was just a lot of information. It's a lot of information on the risk evaluation, yeah. It is. So I know there's about 25 slides, so we are, you know, a little more than halfway through, but can I pause for just a second to see if there are any questions? And you would Absolutely. ask your question. Yeah, you would ask your question by hovering on your lower frame, raising your hand or through the chat. We can um, unmute you if you would like, or you can show your camera and ask the question. We ask that you show, if you show your camera and ask the question verbally, if, uh, please introduce yourself. So we'll just pause for a second here in case there are any questions. Okay, not seeing any, are we, Allison? Nope. Okay, great. Thank you, Katie. I'll, I'll advance the slide for you and we'll, we'll just have you pick up where you left off. So sorry about the interruption. I just wanted to take no a little breather so we could take it all in. <laughs> You're doing a great um, job. Thanks. I do have to let you know that um, there is an update in progress on my computer and it just is telling me don't log out or shut down and hopefully it doesn't automatically log me out or shut me down. <laughs> so I have notified Joel and Jeff that if I disappear, then they can pick up my presentation um, just if anything happens. Oh, that sounds good. Thanks for okay. letting us know. That not that interesting how that always happens at the uh, most- <laughs> Critical times, <laughs> yeah. Times. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, um, so I think we're on slide 17. Uh, so this is a list of the requirements for risk management activities provided by TSCA section 6A to address the final unreasonable risk determinations. EPA has the authority to prohibit, limit, or restrict manufacturing, processing, or distribution in commerce. We can also require record keeping, monitoring, or testing and we can regulate the commercial use or disposal of TCE. And while this list seems limited, I'll highlight some of the many tools under each of these regulatory options that we could use to address um, some of those unreasonable risks. Uh, next slide. So slide 18 continues to show the other options we have to work with. Section 6A of TSCA also provides us the authority to regulate distributors, manufacturers, and processors 
as well as to regulate commercial uses and entities disposing of TCE for commercial purposes. And while EPA cannot directly regulate consumer uses, under TSCA, we have the authority to regulate at the manufacturing level or other key points in the supply chain, which in turn can effectively address unreasonable risks to consumers. So before we move on to the next slide, I just want to take a moment to mention some of the, the tools I mentioned previously that I would highlight. So for example, EPA can set a concentration limit so that certain formulations of products cannot exceed a certain percentage um, by weight of the chemical. We can also require labeling. Um, EPA can also mandate specific engineering controls. Um, this would be like ventilation requirements or use of PPE at occupational sites. Um, though with this option, it's important for us to understand how different workplaces might be affected by this option. So this is where stakeholder engagement uh, is really important for us. Um, other options would be to require manufacturers, processors, and distributors to provide downstream notification through the supply chain. Um, and another example, which I think may be of interest here, is that we can, we can set um, an occupational air exposure limit. The general concept is much like the OSHA Pell or the permissible exposure limit, and EPA would establish an ECL which is an existing chemical exposure limit. Um, then I like to point out that the new chemicals program has something similar and it's called a nickel, um, but the ECL would be an option uh, potentially for TCE because it allows for more flexibility in the workplace. So the workplace can determine what the best method is for them in order to meet the existing chemical exposure limit, um, depending on if they already have um, the engineering controls in place or could meet the limit by using PPE. And we, we do recognize that the ECHL is not the best option for all workplaces. Um, so we would need to be specific for certain facilities. Um, and we're, we're trying to look at all the practical and protective regulatory approaches. Um, and there may be instances where a use may need to be banned and this could only apply to the consumer use while we go with a different regulatory approach for the industrial or commercial use. So a lot of these tools can be used alone or in combination um, to regulate the conditions of use with unreasonable risk. But I just wanted to highlight those um, for everyone to know that we're looking at all of the tools in our toolbox and um, we likely won't use any option in isolation because we want to allow for flexibility in the workplace um, while also making sure that the regulatory approach is both practical and protective. So we can, we can move on to the next slide. And I'm sure there will be questions. <laughs> um, on slide 19, in addition to the requirements to address the unreasonable risk, EPA is also required under section C of TSCA to consider and publish a statement of effects of the rule. So with respect to the magnitude of exposure to human health and the environment, the benefits of the various uses of the chemical and the economic consequences of the rule, um, such as effects on the national economy, small businesses, technological innovation, the environment and public health, as well as the cost and benefits and cost effectiveness of the proposed regulatory action and regulatory alternatives. Next slide. Slide 20 lists the executive orders relevant to the Section 6A rulemaking. So in addition to the requirements under TSCA, EPA also needs to address several executive orders throughout the rulemaking process. EPA is also required to hold formal consultations with state and local governments, tribes, small businesses, and environmental justice communities in minority and low-income populations. Consultation and coordination of TCE will be taking place over the next few months. Um, we'll be doing a lot of this alongside perchloroethylene or PCE. Uh, and announcements can be seen on EPA's webpage for TCE. And if you're interested in participating, then, then please reach out to me and I'll share my contact details at the end of this presentation as well. But you can also find it on the TCE risk management page. Next slide. 
So as we move forward with identifying risk management options, we welcome information um, that any of you may have regarding any views on the regulatory approaches that I've laid out um, and any effective methods to address the unreasonable risks. Um, it's also important for us to understand and be informed on current workplace practices to control exposures such as engineering and administrative controls. And additionally, please let us know of any critical or essential uses and future impacts if TC is not available. We also welcome information on substitute chemicals and safe and effective alternatives, which I know will be part of the agenda today. Um, and as always, we welcome suggestions on how EPA can improve the regulatory process or to be more transparent. Next slide. Um, so with respect to the last point on transparency, if we can go back to slide 22, I think, yeah, there we go. Um, EPA's principles for transparency during the, the risk management process are on this slide. So we are looking to have proactive and meaningful engagement with, with you all. And um, in addition to the formal consultations, we're also conducting one-on-one -on -one meetings and webinars. So the goal of this dialogue is to explain the risk evaluation findings and the risk management requirements under TSCA, along with the options available to EPA to manage the unreasonable risks and what that means going forward. Uh, we're also looking to learn from stakeholders about the effectiveness of their different risk management approaches and the potential impacts on businesses and workers and consumers. Next slide. During the development of risk management options, in addition to the consultations with stakeholders, at the invitation of, of the companies, um, EPA can conduct site visits to learn more about existing practices. Uh, we, were conduct, we were conducting um, site visits prior to the pandemic. And I will say now that we are interested in exploring opportunities for virtual site visits. So please let me know if you're interested in coordinating a virtual visit with us. Um, this way EPA can develop our network of stakeholders to ensure regulatory approaches are fully informed and based on current conditions. Next slide. So slide 24 lists the opportunities for involvement that I've mentioned, such as one-on-one -on -one meetings, participation in webinars and formal consultations. And at this point in time, we are still accepting nominations from those who may qualify as a small entity representative or SIR for TCE. EPA's website shows that the nomination period has ended, but you can still nominate yourself by reaching out to me directly. Um, your engagement and feedback is really important and we want you to ask questions and raise concerns, um, bring things to our attention that may not have been considered and to provide us with information we may not already have. And we really do appreciate this time with you today um, that Nancy has coordinated and we welcome your feedback, especially at this time early on in the risk management process for TCE. And this will help shape the ways we're going to address the unreasonable risks that EPA has ident identified for TCE. And we can move on to the final slide. So this slide has the links to the web pages with additional information regarding TSCA and the risk management activities. And it also has my contact information. If you'd like to get in touch with me, Katie McNamara, the risk management chemical lead for TCE, um, to follow or register for other upcoming meetings and webinars on TCE or other high priority chemicals, you can follow the second link. Um, if you're interested to be a small entity representative, for the formal consultations with small businesses, please email me directly at caitlin.mcnamara.caitlin at epa.gov with your information. Caitlin is spelled a bit differently than you may have seen before, but my email address can also be found on EPA's risk management web pages for TCE. And then my colleague, Doug Parsons, um, 
coordinates the outreach and engagement for EPA's existing chemical risk management branches. So you can reach out to him as well if you're interested in meeting with us or if you have any general risk management questions or concerns. So thank you all for listening to my lengthy uh, um, information heavy presentation and I'll turn it back over to Nancy. I've got a lot of stuff going on my computer right now, but so I'm just going to mute <laughs> and make sure nothing happens on my end. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, thank you so much, Katie. You did a great job. And um, yeah, we did not see any problems there whatsoever. I'm going to stop sharing for a second and open this up. Um, so what we'd like to do is have your questions. And um, I'm going to go first to the raised hand. Did anyone have a raised hand? Okay, then let's go to the chat. Um, let's see. Okay. Allison, did you took care of all of these? Yeah, it I'm not like... seeing any questions in chat. Okay, great. Yeah. <clears throat> Hopefully, if there was any display issue, you would have told me, I'm sure you would have let me know. Um, hopefully I was showing the right screen. So um, I have a few questions that I anticipate are fairly common questions, but we'd first like to hear from anyone um, attending if you have any questions. And if you do, feel free to put your camera on, uh, unmute yourself, chat, raise your hand, whatever you'd like to do. So I'll kick off the first question for you, Katie. Um, can you tell us, um, can you explain a little bit more what the downstream notification is? You said that was one of the tools or controls that you may utilize? Sure. Um, so with downstream notification, what we're looking at is, so this would be something that would be used in combination with another risk management tool. So for instance, if there is, um, EPA would require that a manufacturer, processor, or distribu dis distributor <laughs> would provide the downstream notification through the supply chain to those um, users who are using that that product. Um, and this would be used in combination with um, maybe labeling the product or also um, notifying um, the users that um, there are human health hazards to the product that they're using that um, contain TCE. Um, and if my, my colleague Joel is also on <laughs> the, the line too, and if he wants to go into a little bit more detail, but it's really to ensure the supply, um, the supply chain knows that the prohibitions or other restrictions to the product. Okay, great. Joel, was there, if there's anything you'd like to add, please feel free. Hi, this is Joel Wolf. As Katie said, I am the branch chief of the risk management branch where TC and a number of the first 10 chemicals are. And Katie accurately described how the downstream notification would work to ensure that the entire supply chain knows of any prohibitions or restrictions and obviously to make people aware of either health hazards we aren't looking to add additional burdens with this downstream notification. So we look at the SDS sheet or other parts of your process that already conveys information. And we just will add additional language to that. Nancy, you're muted. There we go. Okay, I was having trouble toggling there. Uh, thank you so much, Joel, for adding to that. Um, so another question came in the chat and said, could you speak a little bit more to the ECEL 
risk management approach? Absolutely. So um, I briefly highlighted it in, in the presentation, um, but the ECEL or the ECL um, is the existing chemical exposure limit. And it would be the same concept as um, the OSHA PEL or the permissible, permissible exposure limit where it's an occupational air exposure limit. So what we're really looking at is um, to find a limit um, that would be one, um, one number that the workplace would need to meet or to comply with. Um, and this would be an echo value that is based on the risk evaluation um, for inhalation exposure to trichloroethylene in the occupational setting. Um, and the echo would be based on um, either one of the non-cancer endpoints or the cancer endpoints that I mentioned are um, the best overall endpoints from the risk determination. And it would, it would propose that um, the regulated entity would assure that no person is exposed to an airborne concentration of trichloroethylene at that level. Um, and, and as I mentioned, this would be a more flexible option for workplaces um, so that um, they can determine the best method that um, would, be, would be good for them um, in order to meet that limit. Um, depending on the engineering controls and the PPE that they already prescribe to their workers, rather than EPA um, prescribing those, those engineering and administrative controls. Does that answer the question? Yes, okay, thank great. you. Thank yeah. you for asking. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, how about, uh, could you explain a little bit more by what you mean by small entity or the SIR? Could you define what a small entity would be? Um, I could definitely do that, but I can also ask um, my colleague Jeff Taylor to jump in here if he'd like to, <laughs> um, as he is handling all of the small entity representative um, nominations and, and gathering that list. Sure. Thank you, Katie. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, the small entity representatives, these would be either small companies or an entity that represents a small company or small companies. And the idea is we want to make sure that we get input from small businesses. I know, Nancy, you were saying that the work that you do really focuses on small businesses. So if there's anyone in this group, for example, or elsewhere who would like to offer input to us, to serve on what we call our Small Business Advocacy Review Panel, that's the SBAR panel. We would encourage that. And then that way we're getting information from different stakeholders. We can make sure that we're um, being flexible with our regulations. I mean, we need to do a job here. We need to regulate, we need to do our risk management, but we also wanna do it in a fair way. So does that answer your question regarding the SIRS? Yes, it does. It, it doesn't necessarily put a specific limit or size. There are thresholds and it varies by what we call a NAICS code. And okay. that, yeah, it gets complicated. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can ask us and we can follow up and um, give you more precise information. There, it's kind of basically like a formula. <laughs> Sure. Uh, to make sure whoever the um, whatever type business that they're meeting certain thresholds. But the idea is, um, yeah, you can contact us separately. So the process right now is we have developed a SIR list. There's still time where you could become a small entity representative, get on that list, participate in our communications and um, 
So please don't hesitate to reach out to Katie. I work alongside her. I'm newer to TCE, but I've been at the agency for longer. So, um, and overall, just in the bigger picture, this is a new process that we're following in many ways with the chemicals. Katie, I mentioned the first 10 chemicals that we're working on now, going through these consultation processes with small businesses, tribes, uh, states. So um, we're open to ideas and we're, we're, we're doing our job here, but we'd like to be open and fair to different stakeholders. So yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, Jeff did a really good job at, at um, explaining the process and absolutely reach out to me if you want to share your information, if you think you can be considered as a small business. Um, and if you're not a small business, we can find a way to um, engage with you as well in one-on-one -on -one or in other meeting engagement opportunities. Okay, great. Thank you. And thank how you. about, yeah, thank you, Jeff, and, and thank you, Katie. So how about critical uses? Have you had critical uses identified? Um, this is something we had a discussion about a couple years ago at one of our roundtables, and I'd certainly invite any aerospace companies um, uh, to speak up related to critical uses. It's important, I think, that EPA hears um, about you know, potential critical use um, opportunities. These could be exemptions, so to speak, or allowances. Uh, Katie, have you, have you heard much on, on critical uses? Is that something you're looking for input on? Yes, we're definitely looking for input on critical and essential uses of TCE. I know this will apply heavily to the vapor degreasing realm, <laughs> um, especially in the aer aerospace industry. Um, and and we we have yet to to hear from from many um, voices on that. So it would be really good to get um, more input about where. Um, if, if you have critical uses so that we can make sure that that um, makes it into the proposed rulemaking. Um, and this is a provision that we have under section 6G of TOSCA. And um, if, if you want more details about TOSCA and, and um, the section six requirements, I'm sure Joel could um, hop in here if you want more information, but um, yeah, we are we are looking to to know what your current workplace practices are and why that why, why TCE is an essential use for you or a critical use for you and um, whether you've tried other alternatives or um, you really need to to keep using TCE and you need more time. Uh, we really do need to to hear from you on that. Okay, and I see that Spirit would like to provide information on critical uses. And if you don't want to provide information here at this meeting, since we only have a few minutes left in the discussion, just feel free to, to reach out to us and, and um, we can definitely set up a conversation um, and make sure to CC Doug Parsons, um, who is the outreach coordinator so that he can get the right people um, on, the, on the line when, when, right. when when we coordinate, great. Great, thank you. And thank you, Melissa, for putting that in the chat there. Um, the idea is that if spirit has a critical use, you know, others may have the same. And so um, if we do wanna make time to discuss that, there is time in our agenda um, a little bit later. If we, if we want to, we can make, certainly make time right now uh, too, if we think that's important. Um, so I'll just pause for a second, see if there's anything else. Okay, so that certainly opens up opportunity for virtual kind of site visit, if you will, FaceTime, Zoom, um, anything with a webcam, uh, as far as looking at processes and showing uh, EPA, you know, why it's critical or why it's already protective um, so uh, that would be great. Sounds like uh, Textron is saying they'll reach out later too. So uh, excellent. Okay, 
Uh, any other questions or comments? All right, with that, we are scheduled to take a short break right now. And so um, I should be showing the agenda here and we are scheduled to take a short break here, 9.30. We will convene at 9.40 uh, with Katie Wolf. Um, she is a researcher on the West Coast that has uh, been working with very interesting projects and she's gonna present some information on her aerospace projects specifically. She is a wealth of knowledge. So, uh, so get ready when you come back. Uh, you'll definitely probably want a notepad. And um, I think you'll be very, very interested in what Katie has to share as well as um, Alicia from the uh, Toxic uh, Use Reduction Institute. So thanks everyone. We'll go into a short break and um, we'll see you in a few minutes. Thanks, Nancy. And um, this is this is Katie from EPA. Just just let me know if EPA should stick around or if she, we should um, head off in a, in a different <laughs> to a to a different yeah. Right. So, Katie, that would be up to you. Thank you so much. You did okay. a great job, um, and I really appreciate that's that's up to you. Um, if you want to listen in on the alternatives, we have stopped recording, but we are gonna.